It's about the restoration of our republic. We want to educate, encourage, enable the power. We stand for integrity, honesty, self-reliance, self-defense, and most importantly, no compromise on our foundational principles. This is America's Voice Now. Find America's Voice Now on Facebook and at americasvoicenow.org. Here's Michael Evans. Good morning, America. You're listening to America's Voice Now. My name is Michael Evans. I am your host this morning. I appreciate you joining with us. A lot of you folks are... um, streaming in on our webcast, and we appreciate that. Thank you. You can always join us at America's Voice Now directly on our website, americasvoicenow.org. And um, if you are so inclined, you may um, uh, listen to the broadcast um, on our live streaming video interface there. Uh, We start broadcasting at 8 a.m. Central, and you're certainly welcome to join us there on a daily basis. Of course, you can also capture a podcast of our program at Spreaker.com forward slash America's Voice Now. And we encourage you to uh, visit our Facebook and our YouTube channels as well. You can find those by going to Facebook.com forward slash America's Voice Now and YouTube.com forward slash America's Voice Now. Basically, if you remember the phrase America's Voice Now, you can find us in a host of different locations. So we're going to tackle a couple of different topics this morning in reference to um, what's happening in the world. You know, we do a radio show here daily, and our goal here is to educate, inform, to then motivate grassroots activism and to activate you to play a part, play a role in your own self-governance. You know, self-governance is a key marker of a society that is that is capable of self reliance and self-sustainability. Where we fall today is way beyond that. We are now at a position where uh, the the tables have been turned, the pyramid has been flipped upside down, and at this point, government is now ruling us versus us owning and, and controlling government for our own best interests. That is a tragic and dangerous place for us to be. Uh, I, I bring to you stories and news and information, and then I an- analyze that uh, to the best of my limited ability. And our goal is to hopefully incite you to go out there, gather enough information to make an informed decision about what's happening in your world. Don't take my word for things. Uh, my goal here is simply to uh, open your eyes and uh, bring information to you that the mainstream ministry of propaganda is not giving to you or at least to take those stories and analyze them and evaluate them in in light of a critically thinking uh, perspective that motivates you to seek out more information and then gather enough of that together so that you can make informed decisions. I believe that education is a key component of our survival as a nation. And one of the reasons that we have uh, a, a, a problem in our government today is that when we look at what's going on around us, so many folks are completely oblivious. They are either apathetic, they are low information, in the sense that lots of folks say, I don't care about politics. It's too divisive, it's too you know, argumentative, it's too controversial, blah, 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 blah. Well, the truth of the matter is, you can ignore politics all you want, but you can't ignore the consequence of avoiding those politics. You see, the reality is that politics affect you. The people who are in power are using their power, their influence, and their money to affect your life. So sitting it out on the sidelines, being a wallflower, refusing to dance, only means that those decisions are being made without your consent and with with the absence of your input. And, you know, I had a a conversation with a fellow the other day. He asked me to come on and do an interview with him. And, and I'll broadcast that when, it, when we've done it. He's the author of a book, and, and he's spec- he kind of works, uh, focuses in on, on uh, issues surrounding health. And one of the things that, that we talked about was how he bridges the concept between good, healthy living or good physical health and the idea of, you know, the, the self-reliance and self-sufficiency community and the preppers and so forth and so on. 
And I said, you know, that's a bridge that a lot of people don't realize is important because, you know, here they are prepping and they're buying, they're spending thousands of dollars storing up food and medical supplies and weapons, ammunition and all those kinds of things in the prepper community. The self-reliance folks are out there, you know, trying to build their own farms and make sure that they've got good access to clean uh, food supply and so forth. And yet a lot of these folks don't recognize that, you know, if you're 350 pounds, which is, you know, 200 pounds overweight, you are literally not going to make it anyway in the event that there was some kind of a calamity or a collapse because you're going to carry that five-gallon bucket of water about a quarter of a mile and you're going to keel over from a massive heart attack. And so, you know, the bridge to health care is very important. The bridge to politics is the reason why America is terrified. And if you're terrified, that should be telling you something. Your alarm bell, the klaxon in your head, is going off. So anyway, let's talk about the four topics we're going to wrap, wrap on today. The first is Obamacare, the better mousetrap. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that in just a moment. That's our first topic this morning. But essentially what we've got is the Obamacare has developed a better mousetrap. And they're utilizing it on you. I'll explain what I mean in just a moment. Our second topic is going to be WebMD. WebMD is a magazine that is considered to be a, a, a by millions, to be an, a definitive unbiased source of medical news and information. They've long been held up as one of the best uh, groups out there because uh, they have, for all intents and purposes, a, a lot of credibility. But... Word is out that they have accepted literally millions of dollars to pump Obamacare propaganda out to their readers. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is one of those – I talked about this yesterday. This is one of those emblematic examples of self-treason, and it is suicide for that magazine. There's an article in the the Washington uh, Times this morning, and um, I've – you know, commented in on it and, and had some some in, input on it as well. And uh, by the way, when you read stories out there in the mainstream media, I encourage you to participate in the comments on the bottom. It's critically important that you do that because what it does is it lets people know what, you know, oftentimes you'll find that the comments at the bottom of a story help you in one, there's links in there sometimes and depends on, you know, whether they allow links and that kind of thing. But a lot of times it helps you to gather enough information to be able to help make informed decisions. You understand and see how the, the, the general consensus and the comments are running. Now, you need to do this on both liberal and uh, conservative uh, biased websites. So regardless of where that story comes from, and it's imperative that you read all of them, by the way, you cannot close your mind if you want to be a critical thinker. The comment section sometimes is more revealing than the actual story itself. <laughs> and so I encourage you to participate in those. I do all the time, and uh, at least where I can. And, and, and I think it's, a, it's valuable uh, fodder for those who want to think critically. So anyway, WebMD has committed the self-treason of suicide because by their actions, they have completely eliminated any level of credibility that they have with their readership and their viewership. You know, they have websites and a magazine. They have completely and utterly destroyed any level of journalistic integrity and credibility that they've had in the marketplace. And I got to tell you, you're going to see the backlash of this is going to be big. Uh, Our third topic, the surveillance police state. Pandora's box or Pandora's gate to hell on earth. News is out this morning, and I spoke about this yesterday. I broke this story yesterday. I didn't break it. I commented on it. Um, That Seattle, which I talked about with the light poles that are going up that are having monitoring and they're tracking your cell phone and everything else, and they're they're reading the MAC address off your phone, even when you're not – even when Wi-Fi is not turned on. And I got to tell you, the news out this morning is that they are actually shutting down – Amazingly enough, they are shutting down the program because of the public backlash on this. So I want you to I want to talk about that a little bit this morning. I think it's an important aspect and we want to make sure that we're addressing it and taking a look at the realities of that. And uh, uh, we'll go forward with that topic when we arrive there. But essentially, here's the deal. Government spying is 
reached an all-time high. America is beginning to awaken to the challenges and the problems. And you need to be aware of what's happening with and, and what they're doing to you effectively, because doing to you is very, very is a very appropriate statement. And then the final topic this morning is going to be amnesty is amnesty equals treason. Now, that's a bold statement. And I know a lot of folks are going to take that the wrong way. I don't care if you don't like what I have to say. You can email me and tell me why. But you better give me good, well-reasoned, logical, rational arguments, not emotional ones. You can email me when you disagree with me in any policy or topic that I talk about. And you can do that by sending me email to mike at americasvoicenow.org. That's mike at americasvoicenow.org. I encourage open discussion. But it has to be logical. It has to be rational. It can't be emotional. Don't tell me that because they're here and they want to bring in their entire family, that that's okay. You've got to give me reasons for why. You've got to tell me how this is going to benefit the nation that has sovereign borders. Okay? So anyway, I don't want to gild the lily. Amnesty is treason. Amnesty equals treason. And we're going to talk about exactly why. You'll hear my thoughts on it, and then you can respond. Okay, let's get into our first story because it's a, it's a doozy. This morning, it was announced by the California Insurance Commissioner that more than one million Californians are going to have their insurance canceled due to the ACA, the Obamacare. And you notice that now, that, by the way, the media is starting to try to get away from the term Obamacare because it's so doggone toxic. You know, anybody who says the word Obamacare, everybody's ears perk up. So what's going on is some of the media, especially the left and progressive slanted media, are trying to um, to redirect the term uh, Obamacare out of the vernacular, and they want to use ACA as an alternative to that. We'll talk a little bit about that as we move forward. But the real issue here is that the Obamacare system and the, and the ACA have built a better mousetrap. And I'm going to explain to you what I mean by that. You see, the concept behind Obamacare is really not health care. The real goal of Obamacare has multiple facets to it. But there, the, the primary concepts are that basically it allows the government 100 percent total access to every individual in the nation. And it gives them undue influence over the free market and free market enterprise because only government can build monopolies and create winners and losers. And so by choosing who you can do business with, and they are doing that, then they are directing the marketplace, funneling, nudging, as Cass Sunstein would say, society from one path to an alternative path that they choose for you. It's a major shift in our relationship with government. And here's the problem. You're tempted by the cheese. You, you know, we, we all know what a mousetrap does. And, and, and if, I want you to keep this analogy and this vision in your mind as we move through this story. Essentially, what you've got here is a trap that has been set. And the goal is to ensnare you. And, and, and the tool that's being used is, first of all, some of it is, is uh, the need for food. And in this case, that food would be the need of every American to be involved in the healthcare system. I mean, none of us can go through life and never have contact with the healthcare system. At some point in time, it touches each of us from birth to death. And whether that's as something as small as an occasional visit to the doctor because you're in relatively good health, but you get, you know, you need an antibiotic for something, or whether that's, you know, you slip and fall and you break a bone and you, you, you need a cast, or whether it's something major where you need you know, major medical treatment, you are in an automobile accident, you have cancer, you need surgery, the list just is endless. It's as uh, myriad as our, as, as our population. The point is that everyone is touched by the healthcare system. So what better way to make sure that you've got a dossier built on every American than to entice them into the mousetrap with the lure of, and, 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 and in some cases, the coercion of forcing you into a healthcare system that they have control and total access and control over. You see, it's a logical path 
if you follow it, down the, con down the concept of authoritarian or totalitarian thinking. The one thing that all authoritarians need is the ability to control the population. And the best way to control the population is to funnel them. You can funnel them by forcing them down a path that enables you to, at the end of the day, have the ability to reach out and touch them individually. You'll notice when a, a, a rancher wants to herd his cattle into a truck, he builds a funnel and then he chases them forward and they move forward they move forward in mass as a group but as they get to the end of the funnel and they've got to get you know they've got to go single file and at that point he's got the opportunity to stop each one and put a tag in their ear or give them a shot of uh, antibiotic or give them a shot of hormones or whatever it is that that they're doing with that particular group they brand them right this is the same analogy it's no different they've got to funnel you and this is Cass Sunstein's nudge principle. And I encourage you to look that up. He actually put out a book about it. Cass Sunstein is probably one of the most shadowy characters out there. He believes that by making societal nudges, using the power of the bully pulpit, the coercion, the corruption of government to accomplish that, that government can have access to every individual and drive societal change, drive societal mores, drive morality, mental capacity, every aspect of our society, religious issues, social issues, everything, into a preconceived funnel that government has control over. They own the funnel. As you get shooted through it, and I don't mean shoot it as in a, a gun barrel. I mean shoot it as in C-H-U-T-E. As you go into the shoot, they have an opportunity to tag you or give you the shot or whatever it is that they need to do. The other area is that as a side benefit or an ancillary benefit, the real issue with Obamacare is that it enables government to not only have access to you on a fairly consistent and routine basis through your medical uh, services, but it also gives them the opportunity now under a forced scenario, a coerced scenario, for them to have you voluntarily provide them with all of the data that they need to build dossiers on you. Now, how, how do I mean that? Well, you're being coerced to visit a website to sign up. You have to sign up. It's not optional. It's mandatory. It's a mandate. And as a result, when you sign up for this, whether you sign up on paper or whether you sign up on online, I mean, you could sign up online if the system worked, but it doesn't. So the simple truth is that you still have to submit all of your information, you, just like you're submitting to the IRS. So you've now got two systems working tandemly, hand in hand. The IRS has been a honeypot for, for, a gen, for 100 years for the government to be able to capture information about the citizenry. Now they know all of your legal information and they have all of your, they have the structure of your business, they have your financial income, and they have all of your names and addresses and social securities and who lives where and all the rest of that. They combine that with census data and they can build a fairly good profile. But now with the advent of Obamacare and healthcare access, now they have one more added uh, subfolder, if you will, and that is your health record. So now they incorporate your health record into the database that they're building on you, and they've got a very significant one. They also take and capture all the information through the Department of Homeland Security and the, mer the massive merger of all state and federal agencies underneath that to incorporate things like your driver's license registration information, all the cars that you own, and everything else that you have. Remember, all of this information is going into vast databases. Now, you know, there are many who out there who will, who, who will naysay this and say, well, wait a second now. You're really pushing the limits of this because what you're saying is that, you know, it matters that somebody's got access to all this data. And I am saying you're absolutely correct. It does. What you have to recognize is that at the end of the path, the goal of the mousetrap is to kill the mouse. And I don't mean to physically, literally kill you. I mean to I mean to say that the end of this mousetrap is the death of your liberty. 
your freedom, your independence, your self-reliance, your self-governance, your ability to influence government as to how you want government to interact with you. Your level of independence, as in you are now dependent upon another entitlement program that is inescapable for every American. No longer is Social Security and welfare and Medicaid and Medicare the only method by which government has an an, an access point to you. You see, they want their tentacles to completely surround you like an octopus, envelops the fish. And the best way to make sure that you've got access to every American, especially those who are the most independent financially and in the best health, because you see, you buy your own insurance. And that's a marketplace with, that's a vast honeypot of information and access and, and touch points to you. So the best way to get that is to put all of that up underneath the control of government. And the truth of the matter is that Obamacare was a sneak attack. The cheese is out there. Now, some people are, 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 are led to it by their own greed. Some people are led to it because they're forced to go at cattle probe gunpoint, if you will. They're coerced to go, right? Your old insurance company kicks your, kicks you off, kills your plan. And now you're forced to go to Obamacare, the website to sign up. When you do so, you're submitting all of your personal information. Their disclaimers clearly and openly state that that information can be used for, one, distribution amongst anyone that they believe has an appropriate need for it. Well, that's a very, very broad scope. Secondarily, there are a lot of individuals who are not in government. They're consultants and agents and, and all kinds of ancillary people surrounding you know, the healthcare, the healthcare bubble, if you will in which they're going to get access to your private information because government will give it to them because they have a, quote, need to know. These are the people who have alleged clearances and so forth and so on. But you can't tell me that abuses aren't going to happen as a result of that. They will. Thirdly, the government itself is an abuser of your data. You're getting profiled. You see, like like Muslims, as an example, had a claim against the idea that you're building profiles based on race or religion or color or creed or sexual orientation or any other issue. They're not profiling single individual groups of ethnic or or religious or otherwise. They're building profiles, period, on everyone. This is similar to the concept that, you know, we didn't really free the slaves in, 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 in the 1860s, we enslaved everyone. We didn't really, by, by you know, I, I don't want to get into that topic because I'll get sidetracked on it. But the point is simply this. We can talk about that another day. And if you have questions about that, send me an email to Mike at America's Voice now.org. I'll try to the best of my ability to answer them. It's a complex topic, but I'll be more than happy to tackle it with you. What you have to realize is that as these as these millions upon millions upon millions of Americans are being canceled from their policy, they're being funneled, they're being forced and coerced and driven to the mousetrap. By the way, for the record, when you submit all of this information, the disclaimers say, one, your information can be shared. Two, it can be used for the purposes of audit. Whoops. Three because they want to de- they want to block fraud, right? Except the problem is that there's far more fraud on their side of the fence than there is on the civilian side of the fence that is being subjected to this. But anyway, I digress. The third is that you're doing this and you're stating all of this under uh under the rules of perjury, right? To the best of my ability, the information I supply and blah 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 blah. And it also says that this information can be used by law enforcement for pers- for prosecution which I would classify as persecution. So let's analyze this for a moment. You submit all this data as required because you don't have an alternative. Now, you're being forced to waive your Fourth Amendment right to privacy, to the privacy of your health records themselves, to the privacy that you have in your person, your place, your effects. Remember the Fourth Amendment. And there's no probable cause. 
you're being forced to do this by another law that overrides or overwrites natural law, the natural law of your Fourth Amendment right to privacy. Worse yet, you're being forced to waive your Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, which is an age-old right that precedes the, the Declaration of Independence, precedes the Constitution, precedes the Magna Carta. It goes all the way back to the birth of man because that's a natural creator, natural law right that you have, the right to not self-incriminate. And yet you're being told right up front that this information can be used against you. And so like a police officer who says to you, anything you say can and will be used against you in court, you have the right to, si- you have the right to remain silent. You don't have that right anymore. Your Fifth Amendment is be- you're being forced to waive your Fifth Amendment rights. Think about that for a moment and understand the implications of it. Don't just dismiss this whole argument out of hand. Out of, out of hand. Make sure that you are recognizing the importance of that system and, and what that move creates. The unintended consequences of this are staggering. Because now all of your information is subject to review. And by the way, that that the government cannot get on you because of constitutional limitations, organizations are selling to the government. They're buying it. So remember, the goal here is ultimately to kill liberty, freedom, independence, self-reliance. And that, ladies and gentlemen, makes us a dependent society upon the monster of government. Once we are dependent upon government for our health care, 47 million of us for our food, right? That's the new number of people that are on food stamps. How many of our veterans are dependent upon the Veterans Administration? Because that's the only place that they can go to get medical treatment. We're talking about uh, now the whole population will be forced to deal with the government in some way, shape or form on their health care, just like you are forced to deal with the government on, on, on the IRS. So ultimately, everyone this way through health care is forced to go by and hit the touchstone of government. Right? That's the goal. Once that has been achieved, it's easy to take that information and compartmentalize it down, find out anyone who rises up as a potential enemy and utterly destroy them. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where the mousetrap snaps shut. The Obama system has figured out a way to build the ultimate mousetrap that no mouse can escape. Think about it. Go back and re-listen to this segment again. Make yourself some notes. Write down a couple of bullet points then ruminate on that for a little while. Tell me that this does not resonate as the ultimate killing machine of freedom, liberty, independence, self-determination, and self-governance in America. You've been listening to America's Voice Now. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, we're going to talk about how WebMD has committed suicide. It is the ultimate in self-treason, and they have accomplished that. They've accomplished that by essentially uh, participating and working with the government in Obamacare's um, endorsement. See, essentially what's happened is now the news is out, and it broke this morning, that WebMD has accepted millions of dollars to endorse, support, and propel Obamacare forward with articles, reviews, videos they've made. A lot of information that's really going to shock a lot of folks because WebMD was the was one of the bastions of credibility out there in the medical community for the average citizen and doctors and the medical community itself. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, we'll talk more about that. Stick with us. You're listening to America's Voice Now. You can find us by visiting our website at americasvoicenow.org. You can find our Facebook page. Please like that page because once you do that, 
our posts show up on your feed and that shares it with your circle of influence. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is all about circles of influence. You can also find every show that we do live on, uh, or that we do re- uh, recorded on our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash America's Voice Now, facebook.com forward slash America's Voice Now. And then we have a brand new podcasting service available to you at spreaker.com. That's like speaker with an R, spreaker.com forward slash America's Voice Now. You can download the, the uh, episode from there and listen to it at your leisure. We'll be back in just a moment. Stick with us. Okay, we record our shows for later broadcast in a host of different ways, and we try to make it as easy as possible for as many folks as possible to be able to gather this information. Um, so you can find us by uh, visiting our site, our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, going to Spreaker.com. We have a playback. Uh, we have a playback module on our website, so if you want to just listen audio only, you can. You don't have to watch the video. I know I got a face made for video, uh, made for uh, for radio, so you don't have to look at my ugly mug. But um, you can listen just uh, on the audio portion on the podcasted side. So please, uh, I encourage you to do that. If you'd like to communicate with me about any of the shows that we do and any of the episodes that we do or the segments that we break out, I'd love to hear your feedback and your comments. Please email me at mike at americasvoicenow.org. That's mike at americasvoicenow.org. The only thing that I ask that you do is that you try to communicate with me by putting something in the subject line so that I understand the topic of that. I get literally hundreds of emails a day. And, of course, the problem with that is a lot of them are chain mails and things like that. Please don't put me on your chain mail list. I don't need that kind of thing. I get tons of that already, and I really don't want to be on chain mails. We dispose of those. We don't really pay attention to that. But I do read those that are individual comments from persons, and they have something to say about a story that we've done or a topic that we've covered or an, you know, a position that we've taken on something or some of our analysis. I love to hear those. So I really, really would encourage you just you know, put in the comment section what that topic was, you know, whether it was, uh, you know, like that last comp, the last segment we just did was Obamacare, the better mousetrap. You know, if you figure out, if if you figure that you want to comment on that, then put that in the subject line so I know what we're talking about. Um, We can also uh, incorporate you into our uh, email uh, newsletter list. We're in the process of starting a a brand new uh, email newsletter. If you'd be interested in that, you can sign up for that on our website. If by any chance you can help us by donating to our, our efforts, please do so. You can, uh, we're, we're, you know, I fund everything on America's Voice now directly out of my own pocket. I don't get paid to do this. This is purely voluntary. This is my Paul Revere moment, if you will. I'm a patriot riding the horse of liberty trying to arouse the uh, slumbering, slumbering giant here. And so if you can help us in any way, please do so, no matter how small or how large that may be. Uh, we're always looking for some some financial help because, quite frankly, this costs me a ton of money to do every day. So uh, you can visit our website. There's lot, links there for through PayPal where you can donate money. You can also mail us a, mail us a check if you'd like. Uh, our address is America's Voice Now, P.O. Box 1195 in West Plains, Missouri, Six five seven seven five. Uh, I greatly appreciate, and I'm extraordinarily grateful and humbled by everyone who does donate some something. Uh, we do have a way that you can do that serially, so that every month it just you know puts five or ten or twenty or fifty or a hundred dollars or whatever it is into our uh, into our system. And uh, I can tell you one thing, uh, and after you've listened to me for a little while, you'll know. Uh, we are 100 uh, percent credible in terms of what we spend the money on everything that we because I fund everything out of my pocket. Trust me, this is there's a, a major red line deficit that <laughs> strikes every month. So, all right, listen, our topic on this segment is the WebMD uh, suicide uh, commitment. And the reason I say that is because 
uh, WebMD is probably one of the uh, most widely accepted and, and has one of the broadest uh, levels of credibility out there in the marketplace. The Washington Times reports this morning that the federal government contracted with WebMD for $4.8 million to spread the word and to proselytize on behalf of, you guessed it, Obamacare. Now, the problem with that is two months before the enrollment began, they began essentially preaching the gospel of Obamacare. When an organization like WebMD sacrifices its journalistic integrity and sacrifices its level of credibility and is no longer objective, the truth of the matter is it cannot be trusted any longer. And for an organization like WebMD that really, quite honestly, has taken the the uh, world by storm. I mean, WebMD is not that I, I don't know how old they are. I, I you know, I don't have all the details on that. But uh, I, I mean, I, I remember when WebMD kind of made it made it big. You know, they were this little website and they, they kind of started building this audience. And suddenly, you know, they were really significantly they were a significant player in the marketplace. They have videos and all kinds of information about, you know, specific uh, um, ailments and problems and diseases and symptoms and what do those symptoms mean and what's the underlying cause and blah, 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 blah. A lot of people go to WebMD to try to do a little self-diagnosis or they've been given a diagnosis by their doctor and they go there and kind of do some homework and research, which is what every intelligent, critical thinking, well-reasoned individual should do, right? Not only do I hear what my doctor has to say, but then I want to go get a second opinion and I want to learn enough about my ailment so that I can be fully in, involved in the in the mitigation and, and uh, resolution process, right? I mean, that's just intelligence. That's what separates us from the animals and the trees. So the, the goal here it, it was for WebMD to help proselytize Obamacare. Now, you know, it sounded initially like they, they had, an, you know, this occasional nice thing or two to say about Obamacare. They created a couple of articles and they wrote one that was uh, the, it, it, that uh, in one article they, they uh, predicted doctors would pick up patients, would add patients to their roles and kind of, uh, you know, touted the fact that in this article was titled Seven Surprising Things About the Affor- Affordable Care Act. And so they, they you know, put out positive spin. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, is that what they were really, really putting out was propaganda. And I'm going to tell you why I say that. You know, I did an article a a while ago and I did a story on it and I did it as a radio program on the Smith-Munt Act of of, um, 1947. Now, the Smith-Munt Act of 1947 was an act that was passed by Congress to prohibit the use of government-sponsored propaganda against or on American uh, citizenry. They can use it overseas, but the idea of government-sponsored propaganda could not be used here domestically in the United States because it's a dangerous thing. When you start talking about the idea of government propaganda, you start thinking about, you know, fascism, Marxism, communism, socialism. And that's never really been the hallmark of America. We don't want government propaganda and manipulation of the press. We want a free and independent press who's supposed to be acting as the watchdogs over government, keeping us informed about where they overreach or overstep their boundaries and so forth and so on. The challenge that we've got here and the problem that we have is that as a result of the Smith-Munt Modernization Act of 2013, Maybe it was 2012. I've forgotten. But once it was finally passed, they put changes in the Federal Register that say that propaganda can now be used on America. 
Now, that article and that, that video I did was picked up by uh, World Net Daily. They actually uh, uh, wrote an article based upon it. Uh, Mr. Kovacs there, who is um, uh, one of the best writers out there, I think, he, he and I'm, I'm gratified. I mean, and I'm not saying that because he found one of my article or one of my videos and, and did an article about it. I'm saying that because I, I, I read w, or, uh, WND on a routine basis, and you should too. The concept here is that the the idea of selling out your da- your audience, if you will, is a form of suicide, which is ultimately self treason. You know, self treason takes a lot of forms. I talked about this yesterday extensively because I did an entire show on the idea of self treason in the form of. In the form of individuals, you know, it takes things like suicide. It takes the it takes the form of people who destruct do destructive things to themselves. You know, you see people who have got the mental illness where they cut themselves, or they they do uh, harmful things to themselves, or they they um, you know work in, or they uh, I should say exercise and 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 engage in harmful destructive behavior, drug abuse, alcoholism, uh, you know, self mutilation, self destruction through the constant taking of pills, right, and things like that. The idea that everybody's out there running around with, with, you know, pharmacological uh, uh, mixtures in their system, these cocktails that are being formulated and sold to us by a corrupted system, including the FDA and the the pharma tyrants that are running our medical system. But when WebMD has literally sold itself out for the purposes of of a small amount of money. And to be honest with you, you got to admit, that's a pretty tiny amount of money. You're talking about 4.8 million bucks. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a disaster for this organization. Because what it has done, and I got to tell you, I read the comments, and I've been reading the comments on on this uh, particular uh, article that was out there in the in the Washington Times, if you're watching this, by the way, um, on our on our YouTube feed, in the co- in the subject uh, matter area that's right below the video itself, uh, drop that box down and you'll see links in there. Every show I do, I put links into the to the reference materials that I'm using, so that you can go along and follow along with it as we're as as you're listening or watching the episode. The idea that, well, first of all, the comments on here are massive. There's a this this story only came out this morning, and already uh, there are, I believe, it's somewhere around 700 plus comments out there. A lot of I, I have to tell you, I've read them, and there's almost not a single one that is supportive of what WebMD has done. And I got to tell you, a lot of them are by medical community people who are saying this is an absolute and utter betrayal. I mean, I'll I'll read you a couple. Just think of WebMD as a Democratic super PAC. Wow. Obviously, WebMD is impersonating a doctor and should be prosecuted. (laughs) WebMD, how does it feel like to whore your credibility over to these guys for just a measly $4.8 million? More Washington cronyism? You don't say. I'm a non-MD who works in healthcare and research and frequently publish papers. I appreciate their niche business and what they attempt to do, but I'll never use WebMD. <laughs> Here's the, you, know, you can see by the tone and the tenor of these comments that WebMD has dealt themselves a mortal blow. You know, they may not be dead yet. This is like the person who tries to commit suicide and fails. But the damage is done. This is like somebody who tries to commit suicide and shoots themselves in the chest and misses their heart, damages their body beyond salvage, but doesn't actually die. <laughs> this one's actually good. What a tangled web you weave when first you practice to deceive. <laughs> I I got to tell you this is um 
going to be a startling change for WebMD. They will lose viewership, readership. They will Their business model is utterly destroyed. And the reason I, I wanted to talk about this topic this morning is because this should be a lesson to the corporatocracies of America. You see, when you betray those who you owe your responsibility, a fiduciary level of responsibility to, and fiduciary doesn't always mean money, right? But, I mean, it generally is used in that context, but remember that you owe your customers, and in this case, WebMD's customers are their readers, whether they're online or whether they're in magazine form. They owe them a fiduciary responsibility of objectivity, of independence. And we see companies that have utterly con- and, and totally betrayed that, sold themselves out to government, or have utilized their resources to actually buy government. Think of Monsanto. Think ConAgra, right? So think of the military-industrial complex out there of firms and companies that go out there and lobby Congress with literally billions upon billions upon billions of dollars and then demand that they and their needs be met. The problem is that their needs don't ally with our needs for freedom and liberty and independence. They don't ally with our requirement that government operate on our behalf. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is treason. When government has betrayed that which it is obligated to provide and perform for, when we are no longer a government uh, of, by, and for the people, we live in a state of tyranny. Our founders, and Jefferson in, in specificity, was very clear about that. When government fears the people, there is liberty. When the people fear their government, there is tyranny. You can't be more succinct and more clear than that. And he actually meant it that way, period. No disclaimers, no caveats. (laughs) Unlike President Obama, who told us that we could all keep our health insurance if we liked it, period. Well, the truth of the matter is that what we have here is a self-inflicted mortal wound that will utterly destroy this organization. And this should be a lesson to everyone else out there who is being plied by this administration, including the Ministry of Propaganda. I'm sorry, the Ministry of Mainstream Media. No, it is actually the Ministry of Propaganda. I want you to take a look at what you hear on the major news media and organizations. And remember that the vast majority of what would be construed as mainstream media, I am not, by the way, under that. I fall under alternative media. And I encourage you to begin to abandon mainstream media just like you will abandon WebMD because they have effectively done the same thing. They have accepted either ideological or financial benefit to sell you out. There was a guy in history quite some time ago who did the same exact thing. And his name today is never been, no one calls this, no one calls their child this name. It's spat out generally, not spoken. His name is Judas Iscariot. And for a mere 30 pieces of silver, he sold out that one whom he owed his allegiance to. Now, I don't care where you stand on the on the religious uh, on the religious uh, line. I don't care whether you are a Christian or you're a Muslim or you're a Jew. I don't care whether you're a Buddhist. The truth of the matter is we know scientifically and historically that. There was a guy by the name of Judas who betrayed a guy by the name of Jesus Christ or Jesus of Nazareth. 
and he sold them out for 30 pieces of silver. I don't care whether you believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God or not. The truth of the matter is, here's what matters. Betrayal. Betrayal matters, and it always matters. With this action, we are seeing the complete and total dissolution of objectivity in media across the board. The press has become a mouthpiece to spew government propaganda upon us. The Smith Munt um, uh, Smith Munt Modernization Act allows the government to now use propaganda against American citizens. I encourage you, please do. Uh, you can go to our website and find the story that I did there, the article there, um, and and it is, uh, or you can go to uh, uh, wnd dot uh, dot com uh, dot net, World Net Daily. You can go to either my webpage and find the story that in the article I did there, and I'll put a link to it in this YouTube uh, video so that you can find it easily. Um, or you can go to World Net Daily and watch it. I encourage you to read that article. And then I encourage you to watch the, the half-hour uh, video that they inserted right in the middle of it because it expresses and explains how our government is now operating in open and blatant treason to us. We are, are the principles of government, the concept of what government is intended to be, which is a vehicle to provide a safe harbor where Americans can benefit. And this isn't limited to America, by the way. The purpose of all governments, at least in theory, is to protect the rights of the citizenry while enabling them to benefit and profit from the fruits of their labor and move about and do all the things. I mean, nobody, none of us want to sit home and have to guard our stuff with an AR-15. We have to go to work. Right. So we employ law enforcement who says, hey, if you commit a crime, we're going to throw you in jail. We delegated authority to government to act on our behalf. But that delegation has a caveat to it. They must act on our behalf. You see, like a lawyer, they owe you an obligation a fiduciary responsibility to do the best they can for you, not to you. And there, ladies and gentlemen, is the crux of the matter. What we have today is no semblance of what government was originally intended to be by, by the crafters of, of our Constitution. Nowhere close if, our, if, if the founders or the framers or the crafters or whatever you want to call them were alive today and could see the status of where we are, oh, my goodness. They would be appalled. In fact, I saw an infographic that was actually pretty accurate. If you recall, President Obama at one point said, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon Martin. And and I saw an infographic somebody put up with a picture of George Je uh, George Jefferson, <laughs> Thomas Jefferson. And uh, I guess I just dated myself to an old sitcom there, didn't I? Anyway, this this infographic of uh, Thomas Jefferson had at the bottom of it. If I had a son, he'd be shooting right now. <laughs> and the truth of the of, of the, the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, if our founders were alive today. They would be decrying the fact that Americans have allowed the tree of liberty to wither and die. I would encourage everyone listening to this broadcast to go on to americasvoicenow.org, and I would encourage you to read an article that I posted going back almost a year now. It's had, I don't know, 100,000-plus people who have read it. I know that's not a lot in the overall mainstream media game, but for me it's a lot. I would encourage you to read that, and then I would encourage you to take that and add to it, modify it, improve it, qualify it. Help me to do what we need to do as a population. 
as a group of Americans, irrespective of our differences on any other issue you want to talk about, whether it's religion, whether it's race, whether it's ethnicity, whether it's legal or illegal, whether it is about sexual orientation, any of these divisive places that government likes to compartmentalize us into. Let's set that aside for a moment. Let's lock elbows as Americans and recognize that if we do not starve this beast that is controlling us to death, that we will eventually lose everything that we hold dear, including our free speech, our right to worship, our ability to love the person that we want, including our ability to be safe and secure in our person and our effects, including our ability to have a Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, including our ability to have uh, a, a co-equal version of government that separates, that, that, that divides state governments and federal government. That was, our, that was the, the crafter's plan, to have this balance of power so that the federal government would never rise above the states because the states are closest to the people. And that government which is closest to the people is always the government that reflects the people's desires and needs closest. You see, that article, by the way, if you want to find it, it's uh, the, the, the plan for re- – uh, let, me, let me actually give you the true name of it. Um, the, the idea of it is real simple. It is the plan to take back America, place all state and federal capitals under peaceful civil disobedient siege. If you go to americasvoicenow.org, below the uh, the, the – video link in the Spreaker uh, player, there's a couple of articles that are listed in red. It's the top one. The plan to take back America. Place all state and federal capitals under civil disobedience siege. Now, look, I'm not going to say that this is the beginning and the end all solution. I'm just a mere guy out there. I'm not, you know, uh, some professional planner. I'm just a mere guy out there who says, you know what? This is out of control and we've got to fix it. And I'm saying that Ladies and gentlemen, make or break, we can no longer sit and ponder who's going to do something for us. Who's going to save us from tyranny? That's up to us. There is no white horse going to ride in. There's no knight in shining armor who's going to sit atop that steed and say, Here I am to save the day. That's going to come from us. There are no superheroes. There's only 315 million superheroes here. And we're either going to save this nation or we're going to watch it evaporate. We're going to watch this descend into authoritarianism, totalitarianism, and tyranny. The pieces are all in place. I'm going to talk about that in our next segment, the surveillance police state. And how Pandora's box, the gates of hell, have literally been opened. Stick with us during that segment because I think you'll find it interesting. What's going on around us where everything is being monitored, everything is being captured, all of your data is being dossiered. It's a dangerous place for us to be. We are literally on the precipice of fascism in this country. You can call it socialism, you can call it communism, you can call it whatever you want. But when we have a government that operates oppressively against its own people and utilizing the tactics that we're seeing here of propaganda like WebMD, I call it fascism. I think I can back up that definition. If you disagree with me, I'd love to hear from you. But this isn't socialism. This isn't communism. This is fascism. You're certainly welcome to email me at mike at americasvoicenow.org and give me your opinion about that. The topic for this particular segment was WebMD commits self, uh, self-treason suicide. By all means, you know, uh, if you want to comment or you can comment on that story, I'd love to hear from you. I want to hear your feedback. 
And I'd like for you to get the, get a hold of that. And by all means, take it and copy it and print it out on Word in a Word document or something. Edit it. Improve it. Give me back your – I need your help. I can't do this alone. I'm just merely Paul Revere. I cannot push and hold back the British by myself. I'm riding through the village, and I'm raising my voice, trying to rally, support, and help to push back the invasion that will destroy our nation, steal and rob our liberty, our freedom, our self-determination, our independence, our very lives. I'm asking for your help. I don't have the, all the answers. I don't presume to, I'm not that presumptuous. I'm just a guy who's out there saying what I'm saying because I feel like no one else is. And it's, somebody's got to stand up and say, hey, you're being fed a lot of propaganda. Are you aware of that? One of the taglines for our website is, you know, uh, it's exposing propaganda, delivering truth and exposing mainstream propaganda because you are being propagandized. Your mind is being controlled. Maybe not in the science fiction sense where you've got a metal hat on your head with wire sticking out of it and you're wired to a chair and somebody's flipping the switch. This is a much more subtle version. And WebMD helped at the cost of their own journalistic integrity. And frankly, at this point, at the cost of probably the vast majority of their viewership and listenership and readership. But it's important that we recognize and understand what betrayal means and that those who are guilty of it pay a price. I would strongly encourage anyone and everyone who's ever visited WebMD, and even if you haven't, I would encourage you to go there. And I would ask that you comment to them and let them know that you will never visit their site again and the reasons why that you will cancel your subscription. I want want these companies to be held accountable for this. The same goes for the Monsantos of the world. The same goes for the Pfizer's of the world that are pumping America full of drugs and and antidepressants. I mean, 40% of America is on an antidepressant. What's up with that? How can that possibly be beneficial to us when everyone is in a state of self-imposed, stunned apathy? You're like a drugged deer standing there in the middle of the street watching the headlights racing at you, and you don't have the will to survive or the self-motivation to get out of the way. If you're on antidepressants, question whether or not you really need them or if they've been pumped onto you by a self-motivated medical community that really is more interested in their stock value than they are in your real health. Truth is, That self-imposed apathy in a blue pill you take every day is not in your best interest. And if you think life is bad now, wait until tyranny rules the day. You've been listening to America's Voice Now. We're going to take a quick break. I'm way over time. I pushed off the hard break on purpose because I wanted to finish this segment, but I'm in trouble now with my producers. So... (laughs) Um, We're going to take a quick break. When we return, we're going to tackle our third topic, which is the surveillance police state. Pandora's box is open and the gates of hell have been revealed. We're going to talk about why I say that in just a moment. You're listening to America's Voice Now. Please find us on the web at americasvoicenow.org. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash America's Voice Now. You can also find our YouTube programs where we on our YouTube channel where we post every video that we do and every show that we do in video. You can find that by going to youtube.com forward slash America's Voice Now. That's our channel. And then we have a uh, a Spreaker podcast that's available. You can get that by going to spreaker.com forward slash America's Voice Now. Or you can jump right on americasvoicenow.org and you can listen to it there. Uh, If you want to download it into your phone or a computer or a a pad of some sort or a tablet, then you're going to have to jump on Spreaker until we can get the download button reinstated. 
The upshot is there's lots of ways to hear what we have to talk about, and we want your feedback and your input, and we want your awareness, and we want your participation in grassroots efforts and activism. We'll be right back. It's about the restoration of our republic. We want to educate, encourage, enable the power. We stand for integrity, honesty, self-reliance, self-defense, and most importantly, no compromise on our foundational principles. This is America's Voice Now. Find America's Voice Now on Facebook and at americasvoicenow.org. Here's Michael Evans. All right. I'm not the equivalent of MacArthur, but like him, I promise to return, and here we are. Thanks for riding with us this morning. I appreciate you. If you're joining with us uh, on our website, uh, appreciate that. Thank you very much. You can capture our our broadcast daily, live, from 8 to uh, 10 a.m. We generally don't run all the way to 10, but uh, at least you have an opportunity to kind of ride with us. And... um, we're working to improve our broadcasts every day. Uh, we've recently uh, completed uh, working on some studio uh, work for for an actual television broadcast versus just radio. Um, for the record, just as a quick update and a little house cleaning, uh, we'll be changing. Uh, we've just obtained some software that will enable us to include some things that will help improve our show visually, like this green screen behind me will soon be a background that uh, will look a little bit more professional. Uh, if you can help us and support us in any way, we're always short of money because I fund everything out of my pocket, and I could certainly appreciate your assistance. You can do so by going to our website. There's a PayPal link there that you can use, and even if you don't have a PayPal account, you can still use it. And uh, I encourage you to do so if there's any way that you can help us, and it doesn't matter how small a widow's might that may be or how big. If you'd like to support our efforts as we move forward and try to build this, we're trying to find a building where we can actually put in a full-blown studio. And uh, uh, if you are uh, uh, an individual who would like to make an investment in liberty and an investment in freedom and an investment in the truth, then please make sure that you contact me. You can do so by contacting me at mike at americasvoicenow.org. Okay, our topic for this particular segment is the surveillance police state. You know, I did a show yesterday about the fact that the state of of, uh, Washington in the city of Seattle has accepted a significant uh, uh, grant from the Department of Homeland Security to install uh, light poles that will actually monitor and track people on the street through your self-imposed tracking device. You know, this cell phone is a tracking device. It has a GPS chip in it that the government has mandated must be in it. Now, their, their, their excuse for it at the time they did it was, well, in case you have an accident and you fall over a ravine and you can't tell us where you are, we can follow the GPS chip. Well, if you believe that, you also believe that, you know, the infinitesimal chance you have of being killed by a terrorist attack is greater than it really is. But I digress. The simple truth is that this particular device has something in it called a MAC address. And that MAC address is an actual hard-coded address. It's like a fingerprint. And it can never be changed. It's physically embedded in the device. And there is an infographic that has come out this morning, which is, and it's incorporated in some government documents, that DHS is behind this this case in Seattle. And I got to tell you, this is Snowden-type, Edward Snowden-type expose. This, this information was captured by the folks over at InfoWars, and I know a lot of people can't stand Alex Jones. They think he's a blowhard and all that, and they think conspiracy theorist. And I gotta, but i got to tell you something. It's also covered under a website called uh, Real Story. Uh, I think it's Real Story. And, and the point is that this document is something that the mainstream media is hiding from you. So that ought to tell you something. This document exposes how this video surveillance system works. Basically, these light poles have a couple of aspects to them. One, they are boxes that can capture 
even when your Wi-Fi service in your cell phone or if your uh, cell phone is not actively connected to anything other than the mobile network that you're that you're um, who's your provide your service provider, you know, an AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, whatever. Even if the Wi-Fi capabilities of the phone are turned off, it can capture the last 1,000 locations that you have been at. You see, GPS works like this. And I, I, I want you to think of the analogy of, uh, if you remember Hansel and Gretel, how they found their way out of the forest. They dropped breadcrumbs, right? GPS does something called breadcrumbs. And essentially what happens is every once in a while, it reaches out, touches a satellite, and says, where exactly am I? And it can pinpoint location down to a few yards. So GPS builds these coordinated databases that it kind of holds in memory. Your phone holds it in memory. And this system goes out and says, that MAC address belongs to John Doe. And I'm telling that MAC address to download the last 1,000 GPS locations that that particular guy has been at. John Doe has been at. Now, of course, that's a a total and complete invasion of your privacy. To make matters worse, this this system that Seattle has employed has camera systems mounted on it that are tapped into federal government databases, and they're incorporating facial recognition and microphones that can actually listen to and surveil the conversations that are going on at street level. Holy smoke. Did we just step into 1984? Yes, we did. You see, the problem is that on page 55 of this port security video surveillance system with wireless mesh network, that's what the the title of this project is, this document has an infographic that explains and reveals the system's communication abilities in regards to the Port of Seattle and the DHS and how they're funneling all this information back to the Department of Homeland Security, despite funding for millions of dollars of taxpayer money. This information goes to the Kings County Sheriff's Office, the Washington State Ferry, the Port of Seattle, Seattle Fire Department Headquarters, the the Marshal Service, Harbor Patrol, a fusion center, which is a... um, Uh, a a Department of Homeland Security spying center built domestically here in the United States for monitoring Americans, Coast Guard, and the police. Really? You mean to tell me that Mrs. McGillicuddy walking down the street in Seattle with her cell phone is being spied upon by the self-same device that she's relying on to have a conversation with her grandchildren? For what purpose? Well, the simple truth is this. The purpose of this, the real purpose of all of this, is to accomplish one thing. The total access of all communications of all Americans, which enables them to totally dominate all Americans. The enslavement of America is actively being rolled out. And you've heard me talk about this if you're a long-time listener or if you're a first-time listener. You know, listen, i got tons and tons and tons of videos out there that talk about this stuff. But we are now living in a police state. It's just that most Americans are completely and totally unaware. We live in a society where everything that you do is monitored, tapped, watched, listened to not only on a local basis, but a statewide basis and a federal basis. How do I know that? And what am I using as my arguments for that? Well, first of all, there are a lot of different systems that are monitoring you and tracking you, including the idea of, and, and this goes all the way back to the, the implementation of, as an example, Real ID. You remember Real ID? Real ID is the implementation of facial recognition so that you can be identified. And you have to show and prove your identity with birth certificate and passport and all of this documentation. Your face is captured, facial recognition, which is a mathematical equation for your particular face 
that is unique to you as a fingerprint is incorporated and thrown into a database. It's put onto a chip on your driver's license. The truth is, Real ID has been adopted almost universally across the country. And in addition to that, there is a few states that have opted out of it, including my own home state and here in Missouri. And yet our governor has implemented Real ID even though we have a law that prohibits him from doing so. When you go to get your driver's license renewed, you are giving up your facial rec- How do I know? Well, let me ask you this. Last time you went to have your driver's license taken, did they ask you to take off your eyeglasses? You got it. Now, there's another article which I'm going to I'm going to incorporate and if you're watching this on YouTube, um, you can find this article uh, in the comment section, or not in the comment section, but in the uh, show description section. This is from CBS uh, in, in D.C. It's a CBS local. Government, or this report, here's their headline. Report, government spying causing self-censorship and privacy fears among U.S. writers. This is an interesting article because this shows you the unintended consequences of what's happening in our society. And for those of you who say, well, wait a minute now, I don't really care if they monitor my phone calls and my emails and if they monitor and and track me where I go. I don't do anything wrong. I don't I don't engage in any kind of illegal behavior. I don't do any drugs. I don't go any places that would be construed as being, uh, you know, uncomfortable. I don't I don't I don't uh, engage in in dangerous behavior. I don't visit whorehouses. I don't go to bars. I don't do any of those things. I don't talk about anything that would be construed or could be misconstrued to make me into a terrorist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I got to tell you, you're making a mistake when you think that way. Because what you don't realize is the impact that this is having not only on you, but on everyone around you. First of all, I wrote an article, and it's, and it's up on americasvoicenow.org. And I would encourage you to go take a look at it because it's a very, very accurate depiction of the idea that the NSA and the Department of Homeland Security and everybody else is fully versed in the principle and the idea and the concept of the six degrees of separation principle. Now, you've all played this game, or many of you have probably heard of it, uh, and and basically what this game is, and it's kind of an interesting game, it's called The Seven Steps to Kevin Bacon, right? And basically this is a, a game where, you know, by connecting the dots and the people who you know Anyone can be connected back to the actor, Kevin Bacon, in seven steps. So, you know, I know this guy who knows that guy who's a producer who knows Kevin Bacon. Boom, there's four steps. Or I know this guy who knows another guy who knows another guy that's in business with a guy that knows Kevin Bacon. Boom, seven steps. The truth is, this article exposes how, and and this is a mathematical equation. First of all, the NSA follows at least four steps by their own admission. So you may be connected to someone who is connected to someone who is connected to someone who is connected to someone that, quite frankly, is (laughs) connected to someone who is suspicion or or is under suspicion or is basically, you know, a terrorist or has donated to terrorism or whatever the case may be. The name of this article and the title of it is NSA, DHS, and border spying is the final straw to tyranny in America. It's on our first, when you first jump on and those, you know, that slider moves by, it's about the fourth or fifth story over there. And this basically talks about the massive expansion of the police state in the United States of America and how every American should be, should be fully aware of how dangerous and harmful this is. Because even if you believe yourself innocent and immune to the dragnet, What you don't realize is that you are communicating with someone who's communicating with someone who's communicating with someone who's communicating with someone that is not. And where we find ourselves now is these massive databases that are being built. I mean, look, the facility that was built in Utah by the National Security uh, Agency is 17 football fields in size. The thing has an electric bill that would cover a city the size of Las Vegas monthly. It is nothing but a magnificently huge, giant hard drive. By the NSA's own admission, 
they can store everything about you in a file in a directory for less than $300 at today's storage rates. At the price of storage, computer electronic storage, they can store every phone call, every email, every web search you've ever done, every piece of mail you get, because the post office is now photographing your mail, every conversation that you have, because they don't save them as an audio file. They convert them to text and then scan them with uh, a, a, a digital interface that says it, it does a, a speech-to-text conversion, and then that text is then scanned for keywords. The president came out a little while ago and said, we're not listening to every American's phone calls. And that was a, bil- a bit of Bill Clinton legalese, because he's right. They're not listening to every American's phone calls. They're taking all the content of that phone call. They're storing it. They're converting it to text. And then they save it because text can be compressed far greater than audio can. And once it's converted to text, it can be stored in very, very small areas. Now, I'm not saying that they're actively listening to Grandma McGillicuddy. I am saying that at some point in time, if there's a need for Grandma McGillicuddy to be reviewed or she can be used as a pry bar to get to someone else, Her information will be brought up, it will be reviewed, and they'll look for a way to compromise Grandma McGillicuddy to get her to either cooperate or work cooperatively with them. You see, what we're building now in the United States of America is a massive enemies list. And when free speech by writers and newspapers and media sources is compromised when, and I'm going to read you a couple of the comments from some of these writers in this article on CBS, because they're extraordinarily effective. There's actually a, a, um, a, a report from this group called the Penn Center, and their, their slogan is free expression and literature. Chilling effects. The NSA surveillance drives U.S. writers to self-censor themselves. Now, this was just produced on November 12th in this year, so it's only a couple days old. I got to tell you, here's their comments. 28% of writers have curtailed or avoided social media activities, and another 12% have seriously considered doing so. 24% have deliberately avoided certain topics in phone and email conversations, and another 9% have seriously considered it. 16% of writers have avoided writing or speaking about a particular topic, and another 11% have seriously considered it. You have to look at the implications and the unintended consequences of what's happening to our society. When one in six writers is unwilling to speak their mind for fear of government retribution, ladies and gentlemen, we are living in a police state. We are living in a state of tyranny. I'm not suggesting that. I'm flat out declaring it. And I'm telling you that your government, your federal government, your state governments, your city and your county and your community governments are operating in open and blatant treason. The job and the functional role of government is not to oppress you. It is not to dominate you. It is not to enslave you. Government serves one purpose. It was intended to be the functional protection of the general society as a whole with a special focus on, in our form of government, protection of the minority, down to the smallest minority of one. In other words, not only is the minority protected of color or sex or racial origin or whatever you want to you pick, ethnic origin, the minority is as small as you. That's why you have these rights that the Constitution doesn't give you 
They don't grant them to you. These rights aren't granted to you by the Constitution or by the Declaration of Independence. They weren't granted to you by the framers. They've been given to you by God, by our Creator, and by natural law. Natural law says that you have the right to defend yourself. You have the right to speak freely. You have the right to worship who you so choose. You have the right to love whom you want. Natural law says that you have the right to be secure and not abused by your own government for their own nefarious purposes to nudge, direct, and funnel you into some social herd Government's purpose is to, is to secure and protect our liberties and our freedoms. And our Declaration of Independence very clearly stated that when government becomes abusive of these principles, we have an obligation, nay, we have a duty to overthrow that government and replace it with one that is more amenable to our needs. Now, I don't want you to take that and say, oh, my goodness, this guy is, is, is advocating armed revolt. No, I'm not. I believe the Second Amendment is the ultimate weapon of mass destruction. It was never intended to be used. Like the principle of mutually assured destruction that comes with nuclear weapons, the Second Amendment was merely a deterrent to protect us from tyrants feeling over-emboldened to go out and commit tyranny. But through a long series and train of abuses and usurpations, our government has become an enemy of the people. And you have become an enemy of the state. Your government fears you. But they don't fear you because you will bring them under control. They fear that they will be overthrown. And that's a big difference. I do advocate massive, peaceful civil disobedience. I advocate that literally 20 million Americans... 25 million Americans, 50 million Americans, rise up and march on your state and your federal capitals in a peaceful but massive show of civil disobedience. We just saw how the Egyptians did so, and they were successful to a point. They made a big mistake. They didn't have an organization a group that was prepared to step into power when they ejected their tormentor. And that void, which natural law requires, must be filled. Nature cannot, nature cannot accept a void. And government cannot accept a void. And so, and I'm not a believer in anarchy. I am a believer in government. But I'm a believer in microscopic federal government, where we need to look for it under a microscope to find where it affects us. I'm a believer in miniature state government, that we have to look hard to see how our state government affects our everyday lives. I'm for self-governance by you, because I believe that you have the wherewithal, the capability, and, the own, and your own self-interest to do the right things for you. I believe that you're intelligent enough to determine what is the right insurance policy for you in your health care. I believe that if you truly care about your child, you'll put a safety belt on that child. But I don't believe that government has a right to mandate that you do that. I don't believe that government has a right to mandate that you purchase insurance. If you choose to go insurance less, that's fine. You must be prepared to deal with the consequences of that, however, and you cannot expect that someone else is going to constantly walk around 
with a bedpan trying to catch what you drop because you refuse to empty your bowels properly. You see, the problem here, ladies and gentlemen, is that our society has grown utterly and totally dependent upon the nanny state. I believe that we have the ability, albeit suppressed, (laughs) it's been submerged, it's been pushed down to be free and independent, to make good decisions on our own. But I also will tell you that when writers are self-censoring, when you are self-censoring your phone call, and you're afraid to use certain words or phrases, we have reached the pinnacle where we have to make a decision. Will we take back our government? And will we force that government to operate within its fiduciary capacity? Or will we completely capitulate and go into that dark night of tyranny? When 16% of the writers who are polled here. And of course, it's a poll and nothing more, but it's a report that's got a lot of substantial backing to it. This isn't a poll that's taken like one of those fly-by-night polls that, you know, call up and twist the results. When 16% of writers out there avoid writing or speaking about certain topics due to threatening privacy concerns, When 85% of the surveyed writers are worried about government surveillance of Americans and nearly three quarters of them, according to their own words, quote, have never been as worried about privacy rights and freedom of the press as they are today. The proof is there. We are stepping into a period where Pandora's box has been opened. The genie has been released. And there's no way that we're going to be able to close those doors with the current people who are holding the box, holding the bottle. We can't put the genie back in the bottle as long as our tormentor, our oppressor, is holding the bottle in one hand and the cork in the other and holding them up out of our reach. We must take the bottle We must take the box from our oppressor and put the cork back in. Put the lid back down. Close the gates of tyranny, terror, oppression. If we do not do that and we do not take that action forthwith, We will awaken to find ourselves in chains. Mental, financial, spiritual, physical. It's our nation to lose. Question is, are you willing to stand up and defend it? You've been listening to America's Voice Now. My name is Mike Evans. I'd love to hear from you and hear about this, hear about your opinion on this segment. I know we can't cover all of it in a half hour, but, you know, by all means, you're certainly welcome to uh, comment to me. I'd love to hear more about it. Our next topic that we're going to cover in our next segment is amnesty equals treason. Let's not gild the lily, folks. Let's just call it what it is. I'm tired of the press setting the tone and the tenor of our conversation when they've been compromised time for Americans to stand up and recognize that until our borders are sealed, no discussion should occur on immigration. This is like triage. We tie off the bleeding artery and we stop the bleeding first. After that, we can save the patient. But we don't deal with the superficial wounds. We deal with the bleeding first. We'll be right back.
All right. We're back. You're listening to America's Voice now. Thanks for joining with us. If you're just joining us, we're in our fourth and final segment. Today is uh, November 13th. It's hump day. And um, this particular segment is called Amnesty is Treason. Now, you can substitute the word equals for is, but you cannot substitute anything for the word treason. This is only my opinion. I'm not saying that you should adopt it. I'm saying that you should take this segment, hear what I have to say, as a good critical thinker will, evaluate the evidence, go out and do some due diligence and do your own homework, and then make a decision for yourself. I don't want you to psychophantically reiterate what I say. I don't want you to buy my opinion and carry it around and pull it out when it's appropriate or you think it's appropriate and parrot it. I want you to formulate your own. The only way you're going to accomplish that is to go out there and truly educate yourself about all the myriad issues that surround it. Now, we've been hearing talk, and there's an enormous amount of pressure being applied to the House to pass an immigration reform bill, a comprehensive immigration reform bill, like the one already passed by the traitors in the Senate. Yes, I did use the word traitors, and I meant to. You see, this is treason. I'm going to explain to you how. When you betray the constituency and the citizenship of the individuals who make up your government, who you owe your fiduciary allegiance and responsibility to, when you violate your oath as a representative of them in a republic democracy, in a republican democracy, in a constitutional republic, then you have committed an act of treason. And it is not in the best interest of Americans for 11 and a half million, which is their estimate. The true numbers are actually about 20 to 25 million. And that's, that doesn't count the chain migration that Congress has already incorporated into the Senate's version of their comprehensive immigration reform plan, which will allow that number to actually quadruple. So let's take their best estimate and say it's 11 and a half million. That's 22, that's 23 million. Quadruple that, that's 40, to quadruple the original number, that's 46 million brand new, newly minted, amnestitized, (laughs) is that a word? Amnestitized Americans who will be able to apply for health care, the right to vote, jobs hmm now we have a massive problem in this country right now with what employment i mean right now we are at an all-time high in americans in 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 our lifetime in americans who are not working So according to U.S. Debt Clock, and I talked about this yesterday, there are 91 million Americans, actually it's 91 plus, but 91 million Americans who are not actually in the labor force. Now, these are people who were previously in the labor force, but they're no longer capable of being in the labor force because they either can't get a job or they've given up or whatever the case may be. And we're about to add, even at their numbers, 11 million more. How insane is that? You see, the argument that's put forth for you to buy into immigration is this. It's the right thing to do. It's the moral thing to do. Well, I want you to challenge yourself today, and I want you to put some critical thinking skills into play, and I want you to think about a well-reasoned, intellectually honest argument. First and foremost, let's recognize that the United States of America, irrespective of whatever side of the ideological fence you're on, is a nation that has its own borders. It is sovereign. 
We have our own form of government. And we don't allow other countries to impose their political philosophies and ideals on us. By the same token, our government has a vested interest and a fiduciary responsibility to act on the best interests of those people who make up the electorate. We elected this group of people. We gave them delegated authority to act on our behalf in matters that incorporated the benefits of the entire nation. Allowing 11 million people into the nation who, I I don't dispute they're already here, but to give them citizenship without the appropriate loopholes closed first is an act of treason. One of the now look for the record, there are many powers that government has been granted as a result of the uh, the Constitution. In other words, the principles behind the Constitution were pretty pretty obvious. We wanted a government that could act on the behalf of all Americans, and we wanted a government that would be able to have certain powers to be able to accomplish those tasks. <coughs> but we limited it, and we expressly limited it to a delegated level of authority that defines the limited power of government. One of the only operations that Congress has, and the president, and the judicial system, is to operate in our best interest, and to protect and defend the border. From invasion. Now, I submit to you that what's happening right now with 11 million foreigners in the country, and by the way, they're not all from from the southern border. Half the people that currently live in the United States of America that are here illegally, they're not undocumented, they're illegal. Let's stop using the PC phrase that they want us to use, and let's declare them what they are. Let's stop gilding the lily Let's stop putting a a nice glossy coat of varnish over dog excrement and call this stuff what it is. Not just immigration, health care and all the rest of this abuse that's going on. It is tyranny and it is treason. And it's time we started calling it that. Because when we face the reality of it, when we use the correct word to describe the correct behavior, then and only then, Have we acknowledged its existence? We are no longer in a state of denial, and we can take corrective action to resolve the problem. And in this power that we gave government, one of the few expressed primary concerns that they were given to deal with was security of the nation's border, to protect individual states and the nation as a whole from invasion. And I submit to you that what we have today with 11 and a half million, and if that's the number we'll use, because that's their official number, but the truth is we all know it's higher, is an invasion. It's not an invasion with, you know, guys running across in green uniforms going pop, 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 pop. But it's an invasion nonetheless. It's an invasion that is affecting our economic system, our education system, our healthcare system, our financial system, our electorate system, our electoral system, I should say. You see, the impact is so far reaching that it touches every aspect of our lives. It's taking jobs, it's stealing the resources that the taxpayers are required to pay by groups of individuals who are not participating in the financial expense and weight of carrying this and you are benefiting from that self-same sacrifice that you and I are putting forth. And government, the federal government specifically, was given the power and the obligation to protect our borders. And the oath that every senator and every congressman and every, every president and every judge takes 
is to uphold and defend the Constitution. And to protect the nation from what? All enemies, foreign and domestic. So if that's the case, and the people who are coming over here, I mean, I get it, you don't want to brand them an enemy because we don't want to sit there and, 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 and you know, throw them under the bus completely. They're human beings, and I get it, and I understand why they're here. I guess if I lived there, I'd try it too. But it doesn't excuse the behavior. And because you're hungry doesn't give you a right to go rob a bank. And it doesn't give you a right to steal from someone else. And it doesn't give them a right to steal from our country. I appreciate their need. I appreciate their desire. I don't appreciate their pressure to incorporate their need into our need. It's not the same thing. And when we talk about the border and immigration as a general consens- as a general consensual idea among Americans, most Americans believe that we probably should figure out something to do with these people without kicking them out. And I'm not totally in disagreement with that. I don't advocate that we pack them all up on buses and airplanes and shoot them back. That's not what I advocate at all. So those of you of the liberal persuasion who have already disconnected, (laughs) stop. And if you were about to, stop. What I do advocate is that before any other discussion happens, before any arrangements are made, that we handle immigration not in a comprehensive way, but in a step-by-step, logical, well-reasoned, thought-out process that, in, that, in, that encourages us to look at the unintended consequences of those actions before we just go out there and throw something against the wall and see what sticks. Or before we allow moneyed interests and cronyism to determine what our new policy will be. What I do advocate is this. I advocate that we seal the border physically. We've sealed and blocked a border that's 160 miles in length between North and South Korea. We've, we've sealed that border for the last 60 years. And listen, not a fly gets over. So why can't we seal our border? I know it's big. I know it's long. I know it's vacant land in a lot of places. And it, I hear all the arguments that it's almost impossible. It's not impossible. We have 80,000 soldiers that we just brought back from Afghanistan and Iraq. The truth of the matter is that if we wanted to stop it, where there is a will, there is a way. And Americans have always shown that as a level of exceptionalism. And until the border is sealed and until the border is locked down where no one can cross, everything else that we talk about after that is a lie. We've been through this before. Back in the days of Reagan, when Reagan was pressured to perform and, and, and grant amnesty, he did it under the premise that and the promise, frankly, that the Democratic uh, the Democratic representation was going to seal the border. And here we are, what, 30 years later, having the same conversation all over again. Why? Because they have no intention of sealing the border now either. And after they get comprehensive immigration reform, mission creep, as always comes out of tyrants and tyranny and and, and traitors, will rule and seize the day. And the border will remain open. And the barricades will come down. And the flood will continue. If you truly want immigration reform in this country, and I believe we do need it, the first thing that we do is seal the border. The patient's lying on the ground. We've come upon the scene. There's a leg that's been amputated. And there are numerous other wounds. Which do you tackle first? Well, first thing first, you get over there and you tie a tourniquet around that leg and you stop the bleeding. Because if that arterial bleeding continues, the patient will die. And all of our other efforts will be fruitless. So the first thing you do is you stop the bleeding. 
And after you've accomplished that, then you begin to deal with the other wounds. And these are wounds, national wounds. There are national wounds of race relations. There are national wounds of economic power. There are national wounds of of, of the change that is being fostered and driven through our society. The truth of the matter is we have an obligation to seal the border first, to, to, to open a period after that sealing has been accomplished that says for a window of six or 12 months, and by the way, if you, like, if, you, if you want to talk more about this and you want to comment on it and you have an idea or you want to expand on it or, 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 or whatever, email me at mike at americasvoicenow.org. I'll be happy to talk about it. But the concept should be simply this. Seal the border first. Once we've locked that border down and it is sealed tighter than a drum, then and only then do we have a period that is six to 12 months where all current people in this nation, unauthorized, undocumented, illegally, must come forward out of the shadows and say, I am here. I am stating to you today that I want to stay. I recognize I have done wrong and I am willing to do whatever it takes to remain here and become a true, valuable citizen for the benefit of the overall country as well as my own personal benefit. By coming out of the shadows, I will be able to gain gainful employment. I will be able to pay taxes. I will be able to reap the benefits of being a member of this society that I left my failed state to come to here because it was better. And I'm going to work to better that betterness those who will not come forward those who refuse to participate we have to make the general assumption that they have that they don't have the best interests of the nation at heart because if we're saying to them when you come forward and register there are going to be penalties you're going to have to pay a fine you're going to have to go out on the you know you come to the tail end of the list to come to be able to be given you get a green card as a temporary card we're not throwing you out But we are saying that you're not entitled to all the rights and privileges of living here because you have not exposed yourself to the responsibilities that entitle you to those rights and privileges. And you go to the back of the line and you pay a fine and you begin to pay taxes and you begin to show yourself approved. You begin to demonstrate to us that you are an acceptable new member of our nation. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the only step that should be taken. And until that step is taken, everything else goes on the back burner. No immigration until the borders are verifiably, independently verifiably, by the way, not by the Department of Homeland Security, who's telling us that borders down to a trickle. The heck it is. I want independent verification by an objective group, a committee who is not paid for by government, who is not dominated and controlled by government, to say this border is truly verifiably sealed. Now, we open up the the registration window and we say there is an amnesty period where you can step up to the plate and say, I'm here illegally and I want to do something about it. I want to do the right thing. You register with us. You say, this is who I am. This is where I live. This is where I work. I'm going to begin to pay taxes. I'm going to become a productive member of this society, which I desire to join, which I desire to gain the benefits of. And then and only then can we figure out how long a term it is, how high is the penalty, what kind of issues surround that. But this nonsense about passing comprehensive immigration reform, and you've got a guy out there like Guterres, who is an absolute monster of a traitor. He says Congress should stay after Thanksgiving and Christmas in order to pass amnesty. He's from Illinois. He's an immigrant himself.
He wants to create a pathway to citizenship for all the country's illegal immigrants. It's a listen from a moral perspective. I'm okay with that. From a moral perspective, I don't want to separate children and parents. I don't want to separate grandchildren from their from their grandparents. I don't want to separate families. But what I will tell you is that they have placed themselves in this position. We haven't invited them here. And they have to be responsible for their actions, just like you do. And if you think walking into a courtroom and saying, I stole from that bakery because my child was hungry is going to give you a pass, you're wrong. And so why should I came here illegally because my children were hungry be an acceptable excuse for a violation of our society, of our laws, of our border? It's not. If that becomes a justifiable excuse for bad behavior and, and, and actions that are detrimental to society as a whole, then we may as well empty the jails and let all the bank robbers and the rapists and the... and Right? You can't have it both ways, folks. You either have a law that applies to everybody or you rescind the law because it doesn't apply to anybody. Immigration reform, and any time that you hear the word comprehensive, know that you are getting shafted because there's going to be a ton of garbage in that bill that has absolutely nothing to do with it, including the one that the Senate has passed. With a ton of giveaways to cronies and friends and buddies and pals and a lot of kickbacks going on. The simple truth is this. We need to have immigration tackled one step at a a time, starting with a border that is sealed, locked tight. Now, whether that takes the form of a physical wall or a wall combined with fences with a separation of a dead man's zone in between, you know, a no man's land or whatever you want to call it, I don't know what that takes. Whether that takes literally guys standing elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder locked, Physically standing there, that's okay with me. But the problem is so large that if that's the consequence of taking care of the problem, that is an acceptable solution. The drain on our society, the change, the fundamental change in our society, the way in which Americans are being tasked, in fact, quite honestly, robbed, To pay for all of this is unacceptable. The government's obligation is to protect the border, to protect the states from invasion. And this is an invasion. Guterres says, I think it's unconscionable the Congress of the United States is going to go away for Thanksgiving with their families. We're going to go away for Christmas with our families while our broken immigration system continues to destroy tens of thousands of families. With all due respect, Mr. Gutierrez, those people put themselves in that position. When a father goes to prison for doing something illegal, he robs a bank or he steals or he hurts someone. His children are deprived of him, too. That is not an excuse, sir. And you cannot stand in front of that judge and say, Your Honor, don't put me in jail because my children are going to suffer and my wife's going to suffer. Why is it for them? Why is that an acceptable argument, Mr. Gutierrez? Because you don't want to stand on the pillars of logic and reason. You don't want to utilize critical thinking. You want to bypass all of that in favor of your number one tool, emotionalism. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is shameful because what it does is it takes the context of the argument away from those factors and features which are truly in your best interest. And it says, throw all of that away. 
and let your tears and your fears rule the day. We don't run a country on emotionalism. If you ran a company that way, they wouldn't be in business. Well, we're not going to sell our products. We're just going to give them all away. Really? (laughs) Where are you going to get enough money to manufacture the next round of those products? You see, there are some basic rules of natural law. And Mr. Gutierrez, this natural law says that you cannot descend into emotionalism to explain away treason. And that, sir, is exactly what you're trying to do. Your own constituents in Illinois should toss you out on your ear, tarred and feathered. They have until November of 2014 to accomplish that task. And I pray they do. America, contact your representatives in the House because the Senate's already passed their version of the Treason Act. And make sure that you express the following to them. No immigration until the border is independently, verifiably sealed. After that, sir or madam, we can have any discussion you want. But until that is achieved, no immigration is acceptable. No immigration act. No comprehensive this, no single that. One thing. Pass that first, and then we'll have any discussion you want. And that says this border is independently, verifiably sealed, and everyone has registered. We can wait a year for the registration. We've been at this for the last hundred. I don't think one more year after the border is sealed is going to really hurt us that bad. Will it, Ms. Gutierrez? Or are you just trying to give us the bum's rush? You see, it's always an urgent crisis when you want your way. Well, James Madison told us about people like you. You know what he said? Crisis is the rallying cry of the tyrant. And Mr. Gutierrez, I recognize you for who you are. You've been listening to America's Voice Now. If you agree with me on this topic or you disagree with me on this, please send me an email to mike at americasvoicenow.org. Find our website at americasvoicenow.org. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash America's Voice Now. You can also find our YouTube channel where we post this and every other program that we do. You can find that by going to youtube.com forward slash America's Voice Now. You can go to spreaker.com. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R dot com forward slash America's Voice Now. And you can download a copy of this particular podcast on an audio format alone. And we'd love to hear from you. Mike at America's Voice Now dot org. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Remember, you know, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is when good men do nothing. Have a great day. <laughs>